Thank you all for joining us here for the uh, Applied PPE seminar at the University of Washington. Um, today's talk is by Anastasia Semenova, who is currently at ISERM and Brown University. Uh, Anastasia got her PhD fairly recently at the University of New Mexico under the direction of uh, Dr. Skrotkovich and Lushnikov. And today she will tell us about super harmonic instabilities of Stokes waves. Thank you, Anastasia. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to give a talk today. Um, uh, it is a great pleasure for me to do so. Um, this uh, work that I will be talking today about is done in collaboration with um, Alexander Karatkevich and Pavel Lushnikov from University of New Mexico um, and uh, Sergei Dichenka from State University of New York at Buffalo. Uh, today's talk uh, will be uh, consisting of three parts. The first part and the second part will be a about Stokes waves in an infinite depth water wave problem. Um, the first part will be mainly about formulation of the problem, and the second part about uh, uh, the results that we got uh, for the superharmonic instability of Stokes waves. And the third part, I will briefly go over some of the results that I got for water waves in a finite depth case. Um, so uh, we're interested in water waves. There are many interesting phenomena, such as, for example, uh, wave breaking or uh, rogue wave formation. Um, but we will consider water waves similar to what you see in this image, uh, waves whose crests are parallel uh, to each other. Uh, this image is taken from the uh, Wikipedia web page. Um, and schematically, we will represent uh, this scenario um, in the left part of this plot. So everything is the same in the transverse direction. So rather than considering a 3D problem, we will consider a 2D problem. Uh, the motion of the uh, inviscid fluid will be governed by the Euler's equations in 2D dimensions. Here V is a uh, uh, velocity of the fluid with X and Y uh, uh, being in the fluid domain. Um, T being temporal variable, rho is the density of the fluid, P is pressure, and rho phi is some external force. Um, in addition, we will further consider uh, uh, more simplifications to this problem. We will consider um, uh, the ideal incompressible fluid that would have a free surface and an infinite depth. The free surface uh, would be represented by one dimensional curve, eta of xt. Um, the fluid uh, would be acted on upon only by the force of gravity. Uh, so we will disregard effects of surface tension and atmospheric pressure. Uh, the density of the fluid would be considered constant, and we will just set it to one. As stated before, x and y would, would be as our spatial variables, and uh, t would be our temporal variable. We will also consider the potential flow with velocity potential phi, and therefore a velocity being equal to gradient phi. In addition, we will consider the free surface eta and velocity potential to be periodic functions in the x variable. And without loss of generality, we will consider them to be a two pi periodic functions in x variable. And um, Stokes waves are just uh, an example of waves uh, that uh, satisfies this condition. Uh, now uh, let's uh, consider equations of motion. Uh, so we will consider a semi-infinite strip in the uh, uh, xy domain, where x would change from uh, minus pi to pi, and y would change from minus infinity to eta, so just a single period uh, of the domain. Uh, also, phi would um, satisfy Laplace equation, and we will have the following three boundary conditions. Uh, kinematic boundary condition, the first one, uh, dynamic boundary condition, the second one. Both of those conditions, one and two, are posed on the free surface of the fluid. And the last one is just the boundary condition at the uh, bottom of the fluid, or at y approaching minus infinity. Um, we will also define uh, potential on the free surface to be C of X and T. Um, so the problem with these equations is that they're 
uh, boundary condition for the Laplace equation one and two are posed on the boundary eta that changes in time. So instead of computing uh, Laplace equation um, with boundary conditions on uh, eta that changes in time, we will consider a, a time dependent conformal transformation Z of WT that will map the um, half strip in the w plane uh, that goes from minus pi to pi and minus infinity to zero uh, it is mapped by the uh, um, z into the fluid domain uh, and in addition line v equals to zero here would be mapped onto the fluid surface so it means that uh, the shape of the fluid surface has the following parametric representation where a function y uh, now of u and t uh, would be a two pi periodic function of u. Okay, so uh, to get the equations of motion, uh, we need to remember that um, uh, the free surface hydrodynamics is constitute a Hamiltonian system, and uh, the Hamiltonian has the following expression, where phi here is a real part of the following complex potential. Uh, and theta is a stream function. Uh, this complex potential is analytic in the lower complex half plane. So uh, the following expressions connecting the real and imaginary part of the complex potential on the free surface uh, holds on the line V equals to zero. Uh, here H hat is a Hilbert and I will go over it in, the, in a couple of slides. So to find implicit equations of motion, which were first derived by Afsanikov in 1973, and then later <clears throat> independently by Zakharov, Dichenko, and Kuznetsov in 1996, we are going to consider um, um, the maximum of the action, uh, uh, extrema of the action. Here, L is just uh, the following Lagrangian. And after we do that, uh, we get the following two implicit equations of motion, both defined on the real line, V equals to zero. And the first uh, equation would correspond to the first uh, kinematic uh, condition, and the second um, corresponds to the dynamic uh, boundary condition. Uh, here, H hat is Hilbert uh, transform. Uh, the, and for a two pi periodic function, it has the following uh, presentation. But we will consider it in a Fourier space. And in a Fourier space, it just basically corresponds to uh, multiplication by i signum k uh, of a Fourier coefficients of k of function uh, of two pi periodic function f. Okay, now <clears throat> let me briefly go over uh, what is a Stokes wave. Uh, so here in this plot, this is just a schematic uh, image of uh, Stokes waves. Uh, those are nonlinear but finite amplitude periodic traveling wave on the surface of uh, a fluid. Uh, they move uh, without change of shape and with a constant speed c. Also, h is defined to be uh, height of the weight is defined to be the distance between its uh, trough and crest. And the ratio of the height over the wavelengths, either um, lambda capital or L capital, is going to be defined as steepness. And uh, it is known that Stokes waves are a one parameter family. Uh, they can be described by either, for example, their steepness or their speed. And in particular, we will be defining them by their steepness later in this talk. Um, to uh, find Stokes waves um, in the infinite depths of uh, water wave case, um, we need to consider the solutions that propagate with velocity c. So we consider the following change of variables, substitute them into the implicit equations of motion that I showed you before, and then uh, it is um, uh, then we can it is. Uh, Mm, possible to derive the following equation, um, uh, which is often referred to as Babenka equation. Um, uh, here in this equation, k hat is just uh, the, uh, the following operator, uh, minus Hilbert times derivative with respect to u. And in the Fourier space, <clears throat> it is just simply corresponds to, to multiplication by uh, Fourier harmonics by a magnitude of k. 
Um, and so all we need to do right now is just solve this equation. We're going to do that numerically uh, by using the uh, Newton's conjugate gradient method. Uh, it can be solved in a uh, Fourier space. Um, so basically what we do is we just define operator L hat to be the following operator uh, in expression four. Then we are going to linearize uh, it around the nth approximation yn where yn is, uh, uh, say, uh, when n is equal to zero is just solution, uh, is a previous solution of the Stokes wave for a smaller steepness. Um, so then once we plug in uh, expression instead of y as a yn plus delta y, we get the following equation where L1 hat is uh, uh, the following operator. We solve the equation phi, for example, with a conjugate gradient method, or it can be solved by uh, any other preferred method if you want, say, for example, minres. And then we plug it in into the expression for the n plus first iteration. This method was um, also used in the paper of uh, Sergei Dichenko, Alexander Karatkevich, and Pavel Lushnikov in 2014 uh, to, to find uh, uh, pretty steep Stokes waves in an infinite depth water wave problem. And that's what we are in particular interested in this work, uh, steep Stokes waves. Um, now, let me briefly go over some of the uh, properties of Stokes waves. Uh, one of the properties is that uh, there exists a um, so-called uh, limiting Stokes wave or a wave of a maximum or limiting height. And it is also known that the angle at the crest of the Stokes wave is uh, 2 pi over 3. Um, also, one another important property is that um, uh, velocity of Stokes waves as function of steepness, as can be seen in this plot, uh, uh, are known is not a monotonic function. It oscillates. So basically what uh, this plot um, shows is that as steepness of Stokes waves increases, and once we zoom in into this region, uh, which is a, a figure in the middle, uh, we see that the uh, velocity starts to, uh, has a maximum, local maximum, and then starts to decrease. And once you zoom in into this region that uh, of this local minimum, we see that, which is on the right, so we, we have that local minimum here, but we see that there is another local maximum. And it uh, continues on. Um, now, uh, it's important to mention about stabilities of Stokes wave. It was, um, uh, it, is, uh, it was found that waves with weak nonlinearity that are that the small amplitude waves are unstable to long wave perturbations. This is often referred to as Benjamin Fair and modulation instability. Also, it was discover, discovered by Bernard and Katie uh, that there is a high frequency instability of Stokes waves. Um, also, there was a, a work by Lonnie Higgins and Tanaka uh, that investigated superharmonic instability of Stokes waves. And um, so basically, superharmonic instability refers to superharmonic perturbations, that is perturbations that having a smaller wavelengths than the original Stokes wave. Uh, another important property of Stokes wave is that its integral quantities also oscillate um, uh, as functions of steepness. So for example, uh, Hamiltonian, uh, if we look um, at the plot of the Hamiltonian versus steepness, we see the same uh, behavior as uh, for the uh, case with velocity. It was demonstrated by Lange Higgins in Tanaka in their 97 paper that um, two unstable uh, two eigenvalues that um, uh, we are going to call unstable eigen modes appear when the first two extrema in Hamiltonian as function of uh, steepness uh, appear. Um, in the table here below, we just, um, as an example, uh, show first four extrema in the Hamiltonian and the corresponding steepnesses at which they occur. Uh, and later it will be important because we would like to know if indeed uh, the unstable eigen modes appear at the steepnesses corresponding to extrema in Hamiltonian. 
Okay, now uh, let's um, uh, consider the second part of this talk, the superharmonic instability. So to do that, we are going to use the following change of variables, um, R and V. It was introduced uh, first by uh, Tanvir in the 1991 and later independently by Alexander Dichenko in 2001. Uh, here P is a, a complex potential. Um, um, these variables are defined on the um, line V equals to zero. So the complex potential can be expressed as just one plus I Hilbert Psi, where Psi, as you remember, is a, um, a potential on the line V equals to zero. After this, for this change of um, uh, variables, it is possible to rewrite equations of motion in this uh, following explicit form, where uh, now uh, there are two new functions, u and b. They just include uh, variables r, uh, functions r and v. But uh, this time there is a, a operator p hat, uh, which is basically just corresponds to um, uh, operator generating a function uh, that would be analytic in the lower half plane. Um, so uh, in the Fourier space, it just corresponds to multiplication by uh, one minus signum k over two. Okay. Now we would like to um, uh, consider the superharmonic instability of Stokes waves. So to do that, uh, we look at these equations six and seven, and we want to linearize them around equilibrium solution, uh, which we will consider to be a Stokes wave. And then we would like to consider the resulting eigenvalue problem. So uh, to do that, we first would like to switch to the frame that moves with the uh, Stokes wave speed C. So what we do is rather than considering R of U and T and V of U and T, we consider the following um, change uh, of variable. So we will consider U minus CT and um, for R and V. After this a change of reference, uh, after this change uh, of frame, equations of motion in the frame moving with the Stokes wave speed C can be expressed in the form nine and 10. And now we would like to express uh, functions R and V as um, the following uh, two sums, where R of U and V of U would be um, independent of time in the frame moving with the uh, uh, Stokes wave speed C, and they would just correspond to the Stokes wave solution. Uh, and delta R and delta V would be functions that would depend both on U and T, and we would consider to them to be small um, and time dependent. Once we do that, we can um, uh, uh, derive equations of motions for delta R, uh, for delta R and delta V. Um, that can be expressed uh, by equations 11 and 12. And what we do next is we just want to write uh, these perturbations, delta R and delta V, um, in the form where their spatial and temporal dependence are separate. So to do that, we just express uh, delta R and delta V is the following uh, uh, sum, where lambda here would be the complex eigenvalue, and lambda bar would be its complex conjugate. Now, what we do is we just plug this expression 13 and 14 into equations into uh, equations of motion for delta R and delta V and collect terms in front of the uh, e to the power lambda T and e to the power lambda bar T. Once we do that, we derive the following uh, four equations. And uh, then eigenvalue problem for the linearized problem may be written in the following matrix form, where delta f is just vector or for, of four functions, and a hat is a four by four operator matrix. Um, uh, before I go uh, discuss the uh, uh, results that we got, uh, let me briefly go over the numerical methods that we used. So to uh, solve this eigenvalue problem, we first want to reduce this uh, four by four operator matrix uh, to a matrix of coefficients A. And to do that, we just apply a hat, a hat to the standard Fourier basis. Then to solve, rather than solving uh, the 
original eigenvalue problem, we are going to uh, use the method called the shift and invert technique. So we will consider the modified eigenvalue problem that has the following form, a minus sigma i inverse, applied to x equals to lambda x. Uh, here, sigma is some initial guess chosen that it's not equal to lambda that we're interested in, but it is close enough to it. The eigenvalues of this resulting problem, nu j, has the following expression, 1 over lambda j minus sigma. So we see that when our guess sigma is close enough to lambda j, uh, nu j's are going to be large. And finding large eigenvalues numerically is an easier problem. Uh, to, to, find, to find the eigenvalues, uh, we use an RPAC subroutine. And once we find them, we just use the following expression to find the lambda j's that we are interested in of the original eigenvalue problem. Um, now, let me go uh, discuss the main results that we got. Um, in both of these plots, um, we're going to look at the square of eigenvalues for different, different steepnesses of Stokes wave. So um, Stokes waves around which we linearized our problem. Uh, blue squares in this uh, plot would uh, correspond to a result uh, from Longy Higgins and Tanaka paper in 1997. And um, red circles would correspond to our numerical results. Um, on the left, uh, what we see here is we see the emergence of the first unstable eigen mode. Uh, we see that the square of the eigen values change sign from negative to positive. So in this region, our eigenvalue lambda for different values of Stokes waves uh, steepnesses was purely imaginary. Then it intersected the horizontal axis and became purely real. Um, we zoom into the region where the sign of the square changes and do a linear fit to see um, uh, what at what steepness uh, this happens. And it, it appears that it indeed corresponds to, uh, to steepness at which the first extrema in Hamiltonian happens. So, and um, it's just this number, 0 0.1366035. On the right, uh, we see the emergence of the second unstable eigen mode. We see that uh, this time we consider um, uh, steepnesses, uh, uh, we consider steeper Stokes waves. Um, once again, square of the eigenvalue changes sign from negative to positive. So from being purely imaginary, it becomes a purely real. And it um, uh, becomes, um, and the sign changes at the steepness, uh, indeed corresponding to the uh, steepness at which second extrema in Hamiltonian appears, um, which is this number. Now, what we were able to compute, uh, we were able to go beyond those two unstable eigen modes and compute a, compute a third one. And um, so this is a plot where uh, we look once again um, on the left of this uh, figure. This plot shows the square of the eigenvalues. And um, the certain stable eigen mode appears for even steeper Stokes wave. And once we do the linear fit, uh, we see that um, uh, the eigenvalue becomes purely real um, uh, at, the steep, at the following steepness. And it corresponds to the steepness at which third extrema in Hamiltonian appears. Now, on the right, we have a, um, a different uh, 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 plot. So let me uh, briefly discuss what we have here. On the real axis, we show that um, on the horizontal axis, we show the real part of eigenvalues computed for different Stokes waves. And on the vertical axis, we have imaginary parts of eigenvalues. Red, yellow, and green circles here represent uh, the eigenvalues for different steepnesses of Stokes waves. So as steepness of Stokes waves increases, we get different locations of eigenvalues along the imaginary and real axis. It is important for me to note that uh, this image is a snapshot taken before the third unstable eigen mode appeared. Um, it is 
Um, so the third unstable um, eigenmode is at this point is still uh, uh, still stable. So the eigenvalues are still imaginary. But if I continue um, uh, adding circles, um, uh, what will happen is that uh, you will see uh, the certain stable eigen mode appear on the horizontal axis. So uh, here, these three dots and these three circles represent the first unstable eigen value as steepness increases. I'm sorry, unstable eigen mode. As steepness increases, uh, the magnitude of these eigen values grow and they're purely real. This is the second unstable eigen mode. And this is our third. So as I said, it is still completely uh, purely imaginary. But if, uh, as we would increase the steepness of Stokes wave, the uh, eigenvalues would move along the imaginary axis. They would collide at the origin, and then they would become purely real and move along away from the origin along the horizontal axis. But in addition, what we also see from this plot is that there is a force fifths and six eigenvalues that will move along the imaginary axis, collide, and produce more unstable eigenmodes. Um, but it's not just six. There is way, way more. So this is just a zoom in into the, uh, or into the region of the origin. Also, there are these um, cyan pentagons. They represent eigenvalues uh, that are uh, not moving as we increased steepness of the Stokes wave. So they uh, stay where they are. OK. Now um, let's look at some of the behavior of those eigenvalues uh, that, uh, whose square changes sign from negative to positive. And we see that there is some uh, universal laws that describe them. Uh, in both of these plots, on horizontal axis, um, uh, we present the following renormalized variable, s max minus s over s max minus sn, where s is just our steepness. s max is the steepness of the limiting Stokes wave, or remember the Stokes wave of the uh, maximum height. sn are the steepnesses corresponding to we, at which extrema in Hamiltonian appears. So in our case, n would be one, two, three, the first three, the first three extrema, since we computed the first three unstable eigen modes. And we see that um, after such a normalization, uh, the square of eigen values um, oh, and the uh, green circles uh, represent the first unstable eigen mode, uh, uh, eigen values for the first unstable eigen mode, a yellow circle. Yellow, yellow triangles, um, the eigenvalues um, that become uh, the second unstable eigenmode, and the uh, blue uh, uh, diamonds, um, uh, they just present uh, the uh, eigenvalues uh, that um, become unstable and become the third unstable eigenmode. So after the following uh, renormalization, uh, we see that all of these eigenvalues, uh, their square lie on this uh, on some on this universal curve, uh, and we see that in particular their behavior um, is well described in the vicinity um, of where s is equal to s n. Um, on the right, so we look we have uh, the same image rather than. Um, zooming into this region where the square of eigenvalue changes sign, we look at the uh, region where uh, our Stokes wave approaches limiting this uh, Stokes wave. So um, in, somewhere in this region. Um, this plot, uh, uh, I need to point, is in log log scale. And we are interested in the case uh, when our Stokes wave and their corresponding eigenvalues um, are are close to the limiting Stokes wave. And what we see is that in this region, the, um, the square of the eigenvalues can be described by the following power law, one over S max minus S. Um, and of course, this is uh, 
uh, pretty good for the first and second uh, eigenvalues, but we don't have enough eigenvalues um, uh, computed for the third and stable mode just because uh, due to the computational um, restrictions. Okay, um, now uh, let me go over um, some of the results uh, that uh, I have for the water waves in the finite depth case. So uh, the problem is similar to what we, we had before. We also have a, a two-dimensional ideal incompressible fluid with a free surface, but this time we have a flat uh, uh, bottom um, um, at uh, y equal to minus d. Uh, we also assume that the uh, fluid is only acted upon by the force of gravity. We will also uh, disregard effects of surface tension and atmospheric pressure. And rather than considering the 3D problem, we consider this 2D problem. Uh, but this time, our conformal map uh, that we will consider uh, will be a little bit different. So Z will be mapping W uh, a plane from minus pi to pi and minus IH to zero. And this domain just would be mapped to the fluid domain that has a flat bottom. And um, uh, once we do this, such a conformal map, we are able to derive a, um, equation, implicit or explicit equations of motion. And then um, uh, uh, also uh, analog of an uh, Babenka equation for a finite depth uh, case. Uh, and here I would like to present um, uh, just some of the uh, examples of what, uh, what can be done in this problem. Uh, so say if we fix our um, uh, uh, finite depth kh um, in the w plane to be say uh, 1.5, um, where uh, it's still not very uh, shallow water, but um, it's, it's not uh, really an infinite depth. Um, if we fix this depth and uh, um, uh, look, uh, start uh, looking at the behavior of Stokes wave, we see that as uh, we increase steepness of these waves, uh, we get a wave um, that seems to approach uh, uh, some limiting wave. Um, and there is also a um, um, uh, 2 pi over 3 angle at the corner of this wave. In addition, uh, the velocity of this uh, Stokes waves behaves similarly to, the, to what happens at the infinite depth case. Uh, so we get uh, the uh, oscillations that we've seen before. Uh, so this is uh, steepness on horizontal axis and velocity on the uh, imaginary axis. Um, uh, so uh, uh, the oscillations uh, start to appear at an earlier steepnesses compared to the infinite depth case. Um, so once again, one, as we zoom into this region, we get the local maximum, then we have the local minimum here, and then uh, there should be a third, um, second uh, local maximum, um, uh, which I'm in the process of computing right now, uh, but it takes um, a lot of uh, effort. Um, another interesting result is that it's if we start from a, say, Stokes wave, but um, rather than fixing uh, the um, a complex uh, uh, bottom of the fluid, we start to decrease it. So say um, we start from 1.14 and then go and then decrease the complex depth. So we are going into the region um, uh, of a shallow water. Uh, we see that um, uh, uh, our Stokes waves start to approach something that looks like a knoidal wave. Um, and I want to remind that uh, these uh, computations are done um, for equation that implies that our solution are two pi periodic. So if we zoom into this region, we see that we have something um, uh, that, so um, we zoom into this uh, region of uh, yellow to black lines, uh, we see that uh, there is uh, our numerical solution represents uh, um, something that looks like a conoidal wave. And uh, we know that in the limit, a uh, conoidal wave also would look like a soliton, so, um, which we also see. Um, uh, 
we do the fit onto this um, uh, solution at the depth of 0 0.165. Um, to, uh, uh, to a KDV solid. Uh, and we see some pretty, uh, a pretty good um, uh, um, fit uh, on, uh, of our solution to the solid. Um, so we, uh, we expect that these solutions are either conoidal waves or something similar um, um, in the limiting case to a Stokes, um, to a solid on wave. Um, Okay, so now let me briefly go over the summary of what was done. So for the infinite depth problem, uh, we computed the first three unstable eigenmodes of uh, the uh, linearized uh, operator for Stokes waves. We also demonstrated, um, we also saw that they occur at the steepnesses uh, that corresponded to the extrema in Hamiltonian. Uh, very fine and also extending observations of Longi, Higgins, and Tanaka. <clears throat> we, we saw um, that unstable eigenvalues uh, appeared as a result of collision of a pair, pair of imaginary eigenvalues at the origin in the complex plane. Um, uh, uh, we also saw that all eigenvalues um, that uh, become unstable lie on a single curve after the following change of variables in the vicinity of S equal to Sn. And we also saw that in the vicinity of the limiting Stokes wave, um, the uh, behavior of the square of eigenvalues can also be described by, by the following power law, one over S max minus S. Uh, all of these observations are uh, numerical. And uh, of course, uh, um, there needs to be more further work uh, done uh, to uh, develop an, uh, some uh, theory for that. Um, uh, and of course, uh, one of the uh, future uh, slash current work is uh, to now study stability of the traveling waves in a finite depth uh, ideal fluid. Uh, and in particular, stability of those uh, waves as it resemble conoidal waves. Um, and not only their superharmonic uh, stability, but also their modulational stability, um, because those waves are periodic. Um, uh, then uh, we also would like to uh, um, find uh, more uh, eigenvalues um, uh, in the infinite depth uh, water wave case. Uh, but for that, we need um, a different, uh, to use a different conformal transformation, because um, as we approach the limiting Stokes wave, uh, we need to have a lot of points under the crest of the wave to resolve um, uh, the uh, 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 crest. Uh, uh, um, and uh, mm, uh, we don't need as much of a points at the tails of the Stokes wave, since they're pretty smooth there. Uh, and then uh, um, another direction is uh, to apply this uh, method to study stability of Stokes wave, but in the case uh, where we have a constant a problem of constant vorticity. Okay, um, and that's it. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.